Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you are listening to this Diverse Places Local Case Study Revision Blast. Uh, our local case study is indeed Oxford. And I think that tagline right at the start there, Oxford is a dynamic international city, gives us a great starting point to understand the nature of Oxford as our local case study. Dynamic international city. So what makes it a dynamic international city? A population of 152,450 based on uh, 2019 ONS data. 32,900 students are enrolled for full-time studies. That's in uh, Oxford University and its colleges and Oxford Brooks. The largest proportion of adults in full-time studies of any city in England and Wales. So already we start to get an impression, maybe, of the role that Oxford plays as a city, the largest proportion of adults in full-time studies of any city in England and Wales. That tells us definitely that Oxford has a huge educational focus at the heart of its place. But then there's another kind of twist here right from the start as we try and understand what makes it dynamic and of course international. It has the third highest ethnic minority population in the southeast of England. Now we will study a particular area, we're going to focus on Cowley Road area of Oxford to study a little bit more about our ethnic minority groups in Oxford. 26% of residents were born outside of the United Kingdom. That's over a quarter. Again, gives us that sense of dynamic international city. Some people use the word transient to discuss uh, particularly the nature of students coming and going and service workers coming and going. We'll talk more about that later. You'll have seen uh, these slides probably at GCSE level and I would advise you, you know, put this on full screen and indeed pause. Feel free to pause. Uh, it also means you won't hear my voice for a short period of time, but uh, you'll be able to extract very interesting uh, detail from here. What have we got here? Well, what we have is a pretty interesting map that, that gives us a really interesting start to think about Oxford as a place that lies in a narrow valley developed basically around the junction of the River Thames and the River Charwell. And you'll see from the map on the top right hand corner, uh, you'll see the areas that are very prone to flooding. And if you drive through Oxford, particularly through winter time, uh, you'll always see the flood plains where the fields uh, are completely flooded. So that gives us a little indication about the use of space within Oxford and the fact that Oxford as a city does uh, move towards the uh, east. It's kind of skewed towards the east and goes against kind of traditional land use models. Um, but that tells you that there are issues with um, potential developments out to the west um, because of flooding. Um, residential land values tend to be um, quite an interesting mix. Uh, of residential suburbs as you begin to move out uh, to the east and to the southeast of the city. Wealthier suburbs uh, tend to be in the northern sector, Summerfield and other small gentrified areas. Jericho does remain near the city centre and has a very interesting past, uh, but now would definitely be considered one of the wealthier suburbs. Lower income areas are uh, definitely linked to the industrial labour force of, of the southeast of the city linked to Cowley. Um, we'll talk a little bit more at the end about the decline, which actually takes us to the industrial section there on the slide, which is Oxford used to have around 18, 19,000 workers based, uh, based around car manufacturing. Now that's down to about 4,000. And we'll talk a little bit about how that helped develop the south of the city. Um, and we'll discuss that actually the perception of Oxford often doesn't focus on that part of the city. The increase in CBD 
uh, activity linked to retail has certainly taken off uh, with the redevelopment of the Westgate opened in 2017. That's also created a large amount of service sector jobs. A lot of rumours where it was around the 3,000 jobs that were created with the development of the new Westgate. Important to know your history and the culture and heritage that's locked up in Oxford. The university, Oxford University, acted as a focus, obviously, for the city's development since the 12th century. And I'll talk a little bit later about how, in terms of cultural and historical attractions, globally, Oxford is rated very highly for tourists. You can see here a slightly more detailed uh, version of the map. Um, showing you some out of town retail areas, some Westgate retail, some other areas. Uh, the mini factory that I was discussing to the, the south, uh, Oxford Science Park, plays an interesting part in the development of the knowledge uh, and research and development element of Oxford's uh, economy. Uh, and the slightly more recent Oxford Parkway uh, redevelopment, which is up there in the north. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about issues uh, linked to that later. So, what state is the Oxford economy in? I mentioned on the right hand side there, Westgate opened in 2017. Apparently, in its first six months, uh, it had 9 million visitors uh, back in 2017. Uh, again, it tells you about footfall, and of course, that creates jobs. 71% um, of jobs are in knowledge intensive industries. So that might tell you the, the type of people that Oxford requires, an educated population. 4,730 businesses provide 118,000 employee jobs. Interestingly, though, not all of those are based in Oxford. We think at least, and this is according to the link is at the bottom there, oxford.gov.info, uh, .uk forward slash info, uh, at least 46,000 people commute into Oxford for work. So um, we have some interesting issues there linked to uh, transport, parking, the environment, which creates a number of other issues for the city. Interestingly, though, um, it's a balanced gross value that's added to the UK economy. This figures from 2016 that that was a 6.75 billion. And then right at the bottom there, and I think this is always important, what are the key sectors of industry that a city bases itself around? And there is no doubt Oxford has uh, a plethora of hospitals, uh, the GR, uh, Churchill, Nuffield, uh, many other education-based uh, institutions, a lot of research and development linked to uh, the Science Park and many other locations throughout the city. Tourism, major, major element of our economy, as I mentioned briefly earlier. Car manufacturing, and they often forgot about publishing. Publishing plays quite a significant part in the Oxford economy too. So that's maybe... Some of those points down the bottom is what we need to think about when we think about what is Oxford as a city? What's it perceived as? Is it perceived as all of those um, sectors at the bottom there? Or is there just a few that really stand out? Is there tensions? Is there uh, cultural tensions? Is there um, tensions between locals, between tourists, between students, between uh, those who are coming in for a short period of time? Uh, worth thinking about. But that was a very positive outlook for Oxford in that previous slide. But it is worth acknowledging that Oxford is not without its challenges. 10 out of 83 neighbourhoods are amongst the 20% 20 20 most deprived in England. 22% of adults have no or low educational qualifications. Now, part of your understanding of your local case study is, is it's really important that you understand, you know, if you think about the diverse places space specification, one of the elements is, you know, thinking about the demographic characteristics. And when we talk about demographic characteristics, we talk about um, gender, age, ethnicity, educational levels, life expectancy, health. And there's an interesting one there when it comes to educational levels. 22% of adults have no or low educational qualifications. So do we have a city of have and have nots, a divide? And does that reflect itself in inequality and link back to health? More on that later. Men in the most deprived areas live 15 years less. 
So there we go. Never mind later. Right there in front of you right now. Um, than those who live in the least deprived areas of the city. So we've got, again, going from one side of the city, you know, maybe if we are thinking about the, the east of the city, uh, and then we compare or the south, and then we compare that to some of the neighbourhoods in the north, and we all of a sudden realise we can be talking about 15 years less in terms of life expectancy. We'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards. One in four children live below the poverty line. Again, very worrying. Where in the city are we finding that? Areas like Blackbird Lees and Rose Hill uh, come out relatively near the top there. What about house prices? And this is always one of those most dis dis discussed points, isn't it? London is very expensive. But when we look at the data, average house prices now, this is 2019 figures from uh, Oxford City Council, are 17.3 times average earnings. The mean house price is now 523,150. Median rent for a three bedroom home is over half of median earnings. Some great figures in here that you can use to back up some of your demographic characteristics and also give you an understanding of what your local place is like. One of the sections we look at in diverse places is perceptions of Oxford. And remember, we spent a considerable amount of time looking at different types of media, literature, poetry. We'll talk about poetry linked to Oxford later. Uh, social media, blogs, newspapers, and so on. So I've selected uh, Oxford-focused forms of media here uh, to link it to an old exam-style question um, shortly. But let's just look at the perceptions of Oxford that we have here. Here is an Instagram post, uh, Caroline Calloway. Hey Instagram, get excited for gothic dorms, immaculate lawns, and a lot of 20-something aristocrats. We're spending the day at Oxford. Hashtag posh. Hmm, interesting. What does it tell us about Oxford? What perception does Caroline Calloway have of Oxford based on this post? Looking at this uh, Oxford-based uh, Financial Times-sponsored uh, Oxford Literary Festival blog, um, what does it tell us about Oxford? Look at the content of it, backing a literary festival. Oxford Mail, again, the type of media is a newspaper. And newspapers are a really good uh, way to get an understanding of the perception of, of, of a place. Because you can quickly look at the front page of a newspaper and get a sense of, or flick through it and get a sense of what's been talked about. But often you get the real social issues. Here we have um, a police car hitting runaway cow, two men caught with a bag of Class A drugs at Morrison's, and deaths in care homes as well as some COVID news as well. And then in the bottom one, we have another blog, but this is a personal blog, Oxford Mumbler. Oxford Mumbler is an online parenting community about days out, classes, support services, etc. Now, what could that tell us about Oxford? I reckon if you were asked um, you know, to, to think about perceptions of Oxford and different forms of media, I think you could pause now and think this is what the different forms of media we just looked at tell us about Oxford. The Instagram one, the social media form of media, beautiful architecture, buildings, pristine lawn linked to the environment and education. Uh, she also gives an impression of class by doing hashtag posh. So her perception of Oxford is certainly uh, one of um, middle, upper class, uh, great educational institutions, beautiful architecture and great environment. That's the perception that that gives us. The literary festival uh, blog, again, intellectual, a place of discovery of your mind and, you know, again, an educated place. But then we can start understanding perceptions of place if we think about newspapers, and as I said, look at those stories 
They tell us about social struggles, issues, drugs, crime, elderly people dying, demographic problems. It gives us the reality. Often newspapers talk about the nitty gritty social issues of life. Um, often sometimes they can be exaggerated or uh, maybe attention grabbing headlines, but certainly they tell us a little bit more about the real issues. And then we could also say sometimes personal blogs um, like this uh, parenting group, the Oxford Mumbler, uh, and it's an honest account about services that mothers and young families can access or often cannot access. Um, and that, again, is a good example of finding out what's really happening in a place. And often the reality is not um, what sometimes social media will off offer us. So in that sense, you know, if you were doing uh, an exam style question, uh, describe the contrasting evidence provided by two different sources um, of the image of your local place. You know, so what type of image um, does your local place give off? What two different uh, media sources um, tell us about the image of your local place? There you go. I, I've, I've just went through uh, a beautiful uh, range. And that's all you would have to do is simply take two of those um, and go for it to see exactly what I just said in those previous slides. And there would be a mark scheme. Again, it's generic. Feel free to pause it here. They have looked at local newspapers, blogs and newsletters by a local authority. That's it. Very, very simple. Obviously, they are just ex examples not linked to the local case study that you may have looked at. Um, but that's quite helpful. OK, um, nearly six million visitors came through Oxford in 2018, supporting 13,000 jobs. That's 16,000 tourists a day on average. Obviously, these statistics are pre-COVID. Um, what do you think the issue is here? And again, I'll share this presentation with you because there's plenty of links that go into some of these slides in a lot more detail. Um, but what is the issue here? Well, pause, have a think. What do you see? OK, well, effectively, this is a traffic warden who uh, previous before COVID was uh, permanently around the St Giles area uh, because there became so such a wide range of issues linked to coaches parking, blocking spaces around that St Giles area. Um, and there is real tension between locals and tourists. Although this article says that we should be giving tourists a better welcome to the city. Traders think that we should uh, not be uh, trying to move tourist coaches away from this particular area. We should be embracing the fact that they are that they're coming. So I guess the local place, you know, what do we have here is, you know, we have a huge influx of tourists, which provides great boost to the economy, uh, which again gives us um, or those who live in Oxford, you know, much greater range of job opportunities. And post-COVID, uh, when tourists return, that will give the economy certainly a significant boost. Another survey, and I've put the link here as well, uh, suggests that Oxford is ranked the eighth most uh, cultural cities, or the eighth uh, in this list of interesting global places, I should say, it, it's in the world. And that's based on cultural attractions per square mile, of which apparently Oxford has 7.21 attractions per square mile. And it really is rich in history and culture. And that, again, is a really important part of Oxford and, and what it stands for. It takes a lot of pride in that. But when we're talking about the demographic characteristics of Oxford, really good to talk specifically about um, areas and not just talk generically. And I think Cowley Road would be a great example of a place, specific place within your local case study where you could kind of learn. It's almost like a case study within a case study. Um, but here's some great stats to, to, to save you uh, going too far for it. Um, Cowley, home to around, according to 2011 census, um, 6,550 people. 64% of Cowley residents were born um, were born in the area. Uh, the Oxfordshire average is 81.9. Uh, 
Uh, Oxford is in the southeast. You can see there I've highlighted it. It's quite small, but it's that kind of orangey road that's uh, running through the middle there. Um, and why is Cowley Road um, such an interesting place to look at from an Oxford point, point of view? Well, I think we can go again to a form of literature and we can go to a poem uh, by Steve Larkin. And if you go to Cowley Road at the moment, you'll see this mural. It's at the top end. Uh, as if you're going towards the Ring Road end, um, just after the, um, just before, sorry, just before the Christian Life Centre, uh, which is an interesting link as well to potentially the Caribbean community that live in Oxford. Um, so this was the poem that Steve Larkin uh, wrote to celebrate the culture of the area. He says is characterised by tolerance, care and creativity. Charities such as Restore, uh, which does great work in mental health, as well as providing a beautiful serene garden and asylum welcome are specifically celebrated. Um, the general wealth of multiculturalism and the mural succeeds in saying what a limited word count tried to say, namely, Cowley Road is a culturally vibrant place with an impressive heritage of music and other artistic expression. Cowley Road, see the people clutch control, safety in the green cross glow, restore the cam, let cycles flow, slowly on the Cowley Road, narcotic and organic meets greenery and artful streets. Here's the interesting one for you. How does ethnicity reflect in the culture, in the, sorry, in the built environment? Eat the globe in one square mile, become another xenophile. Uh, if you don't know what uh, xenophile is, a person who's attracted to foreign people's cultures or customs. Stop a while and say hello, namaste to all Nepal. Chej, I, I apologize, can't one read that or see that. To all the Poles, war and famine in the world, here's your destination, child. Asylum, welcome independence raising aspiration that's a big shout out to the independent sector that uh, Cowley tries to, to to back um all are welcome always have been workhouse poor and those aff afflicted with disease disorders and addictions on supposed lowly Cowley road that tells you a bit about the impression that maybe people have about it where good things come to those that know this leper heritage tolerance zone is home Wow, uh, a be beautiful poem, but it tells us a lot about the multiculturalism. And again, the idea that Cowley Road has all of these great restaurants and places to eat. I really like that line, eat the globe in one square mile. There is one real strong aspect of the um, of Cowley Road being so diverse is the range of um, restaurants and pl places to eat. Cowley Road, though, is also a popular destination for students. And that's where we have to think about, and I'll talk about Oxford and its, its student population. Remember, it's the cultural characteristics. You know, the students make a more youthful population. Um, are the students likely to have impacted uh, land use on Cowley Road? Well, a lot of the uh, music ven venues, late night venues, clubs and bars, help the nighttime economy of Cowley, but it creates tensions with locals. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. So the Cowley Road is uh, within the St. Clements and St. Mary's, as you can see on that map, area of uh, Oxford East. And if we look at the ethnic breakdown, the Oxfordshire average um, white British is 83.6. St. Clement's, 66. St. Mary's, 63. If we go down to Oxfordshire's um, Asian population, 4.8. St. Clement's, 12.4. St. Mary's, 12.8. Pakistani, Oxfordshire's average, 1.2. St. Clement's, 4.5. St. Mary's, 5.1. So what we can see here, and with the graphs below, feel free to pause and extract this data. But think about some of the services that 
I'm actually going to show you in a future slide, but we discussed a little bit about the restaurants and the shops and the cafes previously. Do you think they reflect the ethnicity structured here? So we're thinking about Middle East and Asia, EU, Africa. So let's take those top three, EU, Ascension countries, Africa, and the Middle East and Asia. That's where the greatest... Um, the greatest number of ethnic minorities uh, come from, who we find in St Mary's and St Clement's. So let's then look then, does that reflect the built environment? Are we seeing it in the land use of Cowley Road? Great geography. Well, here's an example of Cowley Road. And we have the Euro supermarket, the Empire Barber's Hot Till Shave, and Pomegranate Restaurant. So what we have here, and again, really interesting, we have our Eastern European supermarket. If you go close to there, it has all the Eastern European uh, flags on display, selling lots of Eastern European food, uh, quite a big focus on Polish food. We then have um, the Middle Eastern and uh, European influences with the kind of Turkish uh influenced barbers, although I know there are people working there from the Middle East too. Um, and then we have the Lebanese restaurant, Pomegranate. So we can see in the built environment, if we go back to that slide, Middle, Middle Eastern and Asia, EU Ascension. And if we go back up Cowley Road here, uh, you know, we can see influence of uh, this kind of scene repeated as we go up the road. But a really good way to understand place and the influence on the built environment and the influence on uh, the characteristics of place is places of worship. And here is just a simple Google map look at the places of worship. And Cowley Road has a plethora of different religions represented by places of worship worship. Um, even we don't have to just be on Cowley Road, we can be around the uh, area and we can see a wide range of uh, various types of establishments for different religious groups. And in the bottom, we just focused on the Middle East and Asian uh, significant population in the area of Cowley Road. And we see this reflected in the uh, the mosque, the Islamic Centre and the Oxford Mosque Society, all located around this area. So we can definitely see places of worship as influencing and telling us a little bit about the um, ethnicity of the area. So we're seeing it in the built environment. But how does this all, all link? You know, What about national policy or regional policy? Have they played a part in shaping uh, Cowley Road. Now I've took some quotes from a website here that I put the link to, opendemocracy.net, which has an article called Two Ends of Cowley Road, Diversity and Its Challenges. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how policy then has, and not just now, but over time, you know, Cowley immigrant communities are linked to national policy and, you know, linked to uh, and connection with that government migration policy of which much is, histo is, is historical you know the Caribbean populations the Windrush generation the former colonies of India Pakistan and then we've got the other conflict zones many of which the UK government was involved with and chose to uh, get get involved with uh, back in the 90s and noughties and now we see um people who have settled from these conflict zones in the UK. I think as recently as last year, Cowley Road had a Syrian restaurant in it. I think, I believe it's now closed down. What about the regional influence? Well, there is a strong, as I showed you on that previous slide, uh, Eastern European supermarkets um, and cafes owned by uh, various different people from Eastern European countries and other businesses as well. So we can say there's a regional influence in terms of the European Union, uh, the free movement of labour, particularly linked to the Ascension 8 back in 2004 when the EU expanded. That is definitely showing through on Cowley Road.
So we've got national, regional in influences. And of course, one of the other big national uh, inf influences we have in the UK is the university education system and the internal migration, the biggest migration in the UK that happens every September under normal conditions and internal migration, um, particularly linked to the student population, certainly brings large numbers into Cowley Road and Oxford. There's some great text here from that particular article that just gives you a great flavour of what Cowley Road is like. Members of established and more recent immigrant communities mix with locals and occasional tourists in dozens of cafes and restaurants. Kosovar Albanians, North African immigrants and recent Syrian refugees gather at Cafe Nero and Coffee Republic. Turkish and Central Asian students visit Bodrum Kebab and the Oxford Grill. And a Lebanese restaurant owned by a Syrian and Kurdish chef attracts visitors from across the city. Add this to the many East Asian eat eateries, a Polsky schlep, a Korean soup kitchen and Indian Nepalese restaurants and local pubs and the temples of worship to complete the picture. In the last decades, churches of many denominations have been joined by a house of the Jewish Orthodox Shabbat Society, two mosques and a seekers hub for those interested in Islam. The East Oxford Community Centre is a meeting place for many African communities. Wow, does that not just give you a great flavour of how national and regional influences have blended together on Cowley Road to form a real diverse community. If you go towards the Ring Road side, uh, there is much uh, shared accommodation by recent uh, immigrants, those from uh, Europe, but also um, lots of students. There's a huge uh, number of, of, of students who exist there. And I love from this uh, we website, this little quote here, next to the student, this is uh, him talking about coming home on a late night bus. Next to students of Oxford's two universities, you see exhausted service workers. Yes, those working in the service industries in the centre of Oxford, low wage workers. On their return home, they will not have the energy and time to tend their front lawns on the weekends or dispose of their garbage in the prescribed ways. So that's telling you about the kind of grit and grime that some people associate with areas of, of Cowley. And the, the author of this, this uh, website is saying it's because of the long hours and the brutal um, nature of the service industry. So there's something to think about there. We mentioned the student population a little bit there. So let's, let's really embrace um, the student population, which plays an important part in the demographic characteristics of Oxford, particularly linked to age and bringing the median age of Oxford uh, right down, which obviously impacts on the demand for services, including things like bars and cafes and restaurants. Um, Oxford's student population is so large that out of term time, it reduces the overall Oxford population by 10%. Uh, over 30,000 full-time students. Again, that's just a good A01 figure that you can that you can learn. Uh, this is interesting as well. 7,500 lived in all student households. Um, now, that's interesting because that creates you know, large numbers of students living together that uh, can impact on local environments, particularly where there's lots of locals. Uh, maybe it might be because of the socialising of students late night, uh, being with friends, etc. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second in a very specific a case study within a case study within a case study. Hopefully that'll help you. Um, but what's happening with students in Oxford? They are increasing. Uh, the general trend, and again, you don't have to um, learn all of this data that I'm showing you here, but feel free to pause it if you want to study it. Um, but effectively, we are seeing an increase, um, particularly uh, particularly in Oxford, uh, we're seeing an increase in overseas undergrads. Interesting to see the locals coming down quite significantly on that bottom left-hand side. Um, but we can definitely see that the general trend is that student numbers are increasing across the two universities. Please feel, to, feel free to pause uh, if you want to look at that in more detail. But this is a really interesting story, which is pretty much happening um, as we speak. Here's the um, the origins of this case, which is the 31st of July 
2019. Developers want to build 137 new flats in Cowley Road, exactly where we've just been looking at. So if you're familiar with Cowley Road, it's uh, where the Tesco is. Um, that's where they want to build these 137 new student flats. Um, it has been well documented that purpose-built student accommodation is beneficial to both the needs of the student residents and the local communities. See the use of uh, different players and different stakeholders here, in which they are located by providing for students' needs more effectively, injecting vibrancy into communities, footfall to local businesses, economic boost, and freeing up local housing, which is important when we have housing issues in Oxford and rising house prices. Local developments state they are, um, it seeks to prevent antisocial behaviour around the site, the 24 hour lighting. It says that other measures would create an environment which is safe, inclusive, and accessible. Um, an interesting line for you to note there is that the City Council allows each of Oxford's universities to have 3,000 students living in privately rented accommodation, but both have exceeded that cap regularly over recent years. Now that's really interesting isn't it because it tells us a lot about the buy to let market and putting pressure on locals in terms of access, accessing housing uh, which is obviously a big issue particularly linked to affordable housing. And here we go here's the update this is 4th of February 2021 again the link to the article is there. Oxford Tesco to be demolished and rebuilt with flats so it's got the go ahead despite the fact a hundred people have objected to the proposals, local democracy reporting service said. So in October 2019, which was just after that previous article, we find out that 100 people objected to it, uh, but it will now be closed, the store, for 30 weeks from now, uh, as in spring 2021, uh, to increase the number of students, 137 new flats uh, above, right in the kind of central area of Cowley Road. Now, what does building student uh, accommodation like that do? And here's an example of tensions between students and locals, because we talk in uh, EQ3 about tensions uh, between different groups. And here's an example of students versus locals. So we're a slightly different area here. We've left Cowley Road as such, uh, but we are on that... Uh, Headington Cowley Temple boundary further along. So we're at, uh, if you go along the Slade, um, and then you take, um, if you're going towards uh, the Eastern Bypass, it's just before it, um, if you're coming along the, the Slade. But this article comes from 2019, and you can see there's a local lady there, Linda Gleason, uh, who's lived in her home for 22 years, and now has this massive block of student flats blocking her light. Um, and basically, she now overlooks the student accommodation. She says all the students are bringing cars. Um, they are causing, she can hear the conversations from their room at night. So basically, they've built the student accommodation right next to her home of 22 years. And she's now complaining that she can't sleep. And there's problems. So you can see that large student numbers in a city, you know, it, it does make a more youthful demographic, but it doesn't always cater uh, and suit those who are local. Important that we discuss as well the economy uh, in Oxford and how that's changed over time, because that has impacted directly on this Oxford divide that we have. Um, alluded to in this presentation. So if we go all the way back and, and think between 1960s and uh, the late 1980s, the car industry in Oxford lost 18,000 um, jobs, basically the equivalent to losing uh, Oxford Uni in terms of the amount of jobs and uh, boost that it offers. Yes, the um, the plant then changed hands, uh, particularly the one that you'll recognise now as being uh, owned by BMW and being the uh, the heart of the Mini. They've stopped making the Rover now. Um, so operations are basically on this southeast plant now, and they closed down the old North Works and South Works, which were inside the Ring Road, and now basically just industrial estates. Um, but why is this interesting from a, a local city case study? Well. 
the biggest issue is that it's not only the jobs that it loses. You know, this is the 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 jobs that people came to Oxford originally in the fifties and sixties to get these great jobs, these um, secondary sector jobs. But it then created a, a network of suppliers, local businesses within Oxford, who were able to offer supplies to the plant. So when those jobs are lost, it's just got this negative multiplier effect in those areas um, where people were living. And we know that those people that were working in the uh, car manufacturing sector tended to live in a number uh, of very um, specific areas of the city. And that's now caused serious issues now and probably the deprivation and inequality legacy remains uh, from that and we'll talk about that in a second interestingly if you're going to talk about swindon as a contrasting place um, that now the steel that the oxford um, plant now uses comes from swindon so i gave an impression there um, that actually looking at the industrial past and the deindustrialization has now led to the Oxford we know today. And that's where I, I kind of come back to this. Oxford's history of town and gown, um, you know, it, it goes all the way back to, I guess, the, the, the kind of early 1900s. But um, the Blackbird Lees population, um, the, the, the estate very close to the mini factory there that I just showed you, um, and again, feel free to pause and look at these articles here because it talks about the areas, you know, very close to the the uh, south that actually are now the most deprived. And the Blackbirdley's estate, especially, um, most of the men worked in the car factory. Half of the population in the sixties had moved from elsewhere, from Scotland, from Ireland, in large numbers. Uh, from other places in England for employment, and they moved to the Blackbird Lees estate um, in or you know, as the estate uh, had been developed, and it was where they were hopefully going to be living and working very close by, and it was perfect. But when you have deindustrialization and the loss of jobs to this extent, it's always had a bad reputation, a reputation that many people don't know of existing in Oxford. And you'll see by some of the, the text there, unlit building sites, inadequate police supervision, parental apathy and the provision of a public house catering mainly for young men has provided the perfect setting for the idle, the mischievous uh, and the more sinister night people. You know, that gives us a, you know, a, 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 an impression of Oxford that many of us, if you've never been, you know, if, if you speak to someone who's never been to Oxford, they would never think that we that we have a more industrial and working class um, number of areas in this estates. So let's pause there briefly and just think how can we put this into uh, a lot of knowledge and you know, a lot of uh, really interesting stuff there, but how do we work it into a question? Explain how regional and national influences have shaped the demographic characteristics of your local place. Now, if you're thinking, oh, it keeps coming up, demographic characteristics, what do I mean? There they are in red. Always think gender, age, ethnicity, educational levels, life expectancy, health and migration. We've covered a number of these already in this session. So I would suggest pause, go back and try and think where has Mr Cunningham made links to a number of these demographic characteristics and can I use it? To come up with an answer for that. If you go back to the Cowley Road slide, I discuss specifically regional and national influences linked to Cowley Road. Not even Oxford, really specific. We've not really touched on educational levels and life expectancy dash health, and I'll come on to that in a second. But you could, based on what we've already covered, answer this question. I would consider pausing on a six mark explain question we are talking about a01 it is knowledge it is explaining for straight up six a01 assessment objective one knowledge um, and understanding it's your local place so if you're going to um 
look at what you should be uh, focusing on it as a place. It's, it's, it's got to be Oxford as your local place. So have a little think. Feel free to pause. And there is the question uh, and it's exam format. And there is just some ideas. Um, again, it's just a genetic mark scheme. So if you have attempted that question um, or you are uh, wanting to try and build up some further ideas on that, do feel free again to pause and see if you can um, gain some more ideas. Do feel free. It's always useful to take a mark scheme and take out those key points that you think, actually, I could use those key points as uh, notes headings, you know, note headings in order to build around your local place. Okay, I promised you um, thinking about health, life expectancy and education. Now, this comes from uh, oxfordshire.gov.uk, uh, the public health annual report from May 2020. So it's relatively good in terms of being up to date. Um, the health-wise, uh, we can focus on a number of um, areas in the future slides, but let's focus on education here. National average, 56.6% of people achieve five A star to C's at GCSE. Um, the Oxfordshire, this is Oxfordshire, so not just Oxford. Oxfordshire average is only 36%. Hold on a minute. We started off this session talking about Oxford and the perception of it being a place for educational excellence, significantly below national average in terms of students achieving five A star to C GCSEs. What do we also notice here? And again, feel free to uh, pause it. Link to health uh, and deprivation. We've got a number of factors here, but the obesity in year six, 28.2%. Above a national average of 20% is also concerning when it comes to children and their health. I would uh, also note there are significant hospital admissions for self harm, uh, which is 364.5, national average of 100. Uh, that is really incredibly high. Um, that may well be linked to the high pressure. Um, high pressure nature of uh, university education and potentially also the high levels of deprivation that we have in other areas of the city. So there's a lot of real stress um, issues going on here. Now, it's important when you're thinking about your local case study to think about the differences within the city, which is why we looked at the Cowley Road area earlier. But it would be worth pausing this and looking at different areas of the city. Let's continue to take Blackbird Lees and we can see male life expectancy significantly below areas. Um, a good example, Northfield Brook, um, significantly below that, significantly below um, particularly the difference between male and female. If we're looking at demographic characteristics, um, we can definitely say there's a big difference, as we do find in many places, between male and female. Um, but the life expectancy for gap for men living in Carfax to the least deprived ward in Oxfordshire is 15 years. 15 years difference if you live in the wealthy, uh, wealthiest area to the most deprived. That's basically all the figure you need about demographic characteristic of life expectancy for your local case study. Uh, feel free to pause this if you want to add a little bit about disability-free life expectancy. And again, you can see the um, long-term illnesses or disabilities that many people uh, suffer from in the least uh, the most deprived areas of Oxford. And again, let's smash that uh, perception uh, that Oxford is um, just a very affluent place because Oxford, yes, is one of the most affluent areas of the country, but that's in the areas that are doing very well. But there are areas that are doing really badly um, because it hides the most astonishing fact that 10 wards feature in the 20 percent most deprived in England and they are the areas there you'll notice a number of them uh, hang around the centre uh, central areas of Oxford which is also interesting uh, for you to note. Um, I thought I'd just put in a little slide here that comes from and again feel free to pause this um, it's really good 
um, to think about positive stuff as well on Health Watch Oxfordshire, engaging with men from uh, minority communities in East Oxford, uh, discussing issues like uh, mental health and uh, getting NHS health checks, uh, really focusing in on uh, the black, Asian and minority ethnic background uh, men. Uh, so it's just a quite a useful little example if you wanted to talk about um, you know, action that's been taken to try and reduce the inequality and problems that are there, particularly when the data for gender differences in Oxford show a significant um, issue with, with men when it comes to, to health. I'm going to finish off this session um, looking at education as one of our demographic characteristics, and we can look at the difference in education. I want to focus, there's a number of uh, areas here. You can look at the EBAC scores if you want, uh, which is the proportion of children who secure a five uh, in English, math, science, humanity, and a language G GCSE. Um, there's a number of EBAC stats in there that you can have a look at or extract. But I want to focus on grade five or above in English and maths because it's a good indicator of how well things are going in that area, isn't it? You know, how many students are leaving with grade five or above in English and maths? 64% uh, of those in Charwell. So I want you to think about where the areas um, are located. So, you know, that's 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 good. That's well above average, according to the, the description for its progress eight. Um, so we can get an, an, an idea of the school doing, doing quite well. Let's move down the list and we go to St Gregory the Great Catholic School, which is located in the uh, Cowley area. And we jump grade five or above in English and maths, 33%, which is, which is uh, considerably uh, nearly 30% below Charwell here. So we've jumped um, in location by, what, two and a half miles towards our Cowley area. And we nearly half uh, the percentage of students who are getting uh, from 60 odd percent to 30 odd percent. Of those who get in grade five or above in English and maths. Let me go more towards again. We were looking at the mini plant and around that uh, Blackbird Lees, Littlemore area, and that's where we find the Oxford Academy. And the shocking statistic that only seventeen percent get a grade five or above in English and maths at GCSE. So that gives us an indication about the differences in educational attainment across Oxford as well. And it gives us a real strong story of inequality. And if we think back to Cowley, uh, Cowley, Cowley Temple, Blackbird Lees, where a great number of ethnic minority people are living, you know, that does come under the catchment here for the Oxford Academy for St Gregory the Great. So it's interesting that we do have uh, an ethnic dimension to this as well. And you'll be aware that um, Headington um, has been supporting Into University, uh, a charity that, that work in, in uh, Blackbird Lee's area to try and improve educational attainment. That's just another good example of a charity that's working uh, to try and make things better. I hope that has helped you as a bit of a revision blast to try and make you understand uh, just some ideas. Remember, you may have your own notes, your own ideas. I've only covered a few areas here, largely based around students, uh, the economy, Cowley Road and ethnic minority groups there. But there's a huge range of examples that you could potentially use. I hope that's been helpful. A good revision blast on diverse places from myself, Mr Cunningham. Have a great morning, afternoon or night. Ciao.